frustration, the overriding emotion again for Norwich City on their travels. Plenty to discuss this week on the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. I'm your host, Connor Southwell, joined by my esteemed colleague, Samuel Seaman, and also by Norfolk's most loved Frenchman. I think we can give you that title. Former Norwich City player, Cedric Onsalon joins us this week as well. Cedric, we've been meaning to get you on. I mean, we were having this conversation for a little while. It's finally yeah. happened. Thank you very much for, for coming on. How, how are things with you? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. As you obviously mentioned, we've been in contact for a numerous month now. I've been trying to put that together and always something happened during the, a week or so. It was a game or we're busy. So, yeah, it's nice to be part of you guys. Thank you for yeah, having well, me. Yeah, pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And thanks for thanks for coming on. And sorry that we, we couldn't give you a win to talk about. That would have been uh, <laughs> that would have been much nicer. But it, it, it is what it is. Of course, this uh, podcast is brought to you by Coleman's of Norwich, as is um, as is every episode. Sam, how, how are you? Uh, long, long old poke yesterday and Friday, wasn't it, for, for us up to up to Lancashire, as it was for all of those Norwich City fans who attended. Uh, they're really deceptive, those Northwest games in terms of length, aren't they? You get to, uh, it feels like you've been on the road for hours and you've not even hit Sleaford, you know, it's, it's one of those. Yeah, I'm quite glad we've we've recorded a little bit later than usual, to be honest, because quite often I'm I'm doing the podcast sort of half asleep at 10 in the morning, having got back to my flat at one or two. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite glad I've had a little while to, to warm back up after that long trip. But, yeah, I, th- I thought we did it in sort of all right time. Obviously, mo- both uh, you and me, fantastic conversationalists, so we were entertained <laughs> all the way. And, uh, yeah, it was all right. But I am I am glad to be, to be back in the fine city now and uh, maybe not. I don't know if looking forward is is the best way to talk about 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 yesterday, but um, it definitely did provide enough enough talking points. So yeah, looking forward to uh, to analysing it a little bit. Yeah, you kept me awake on the live jo- uh, live drive home, which you know would have been pretty uh, well, it would have been fatal had it had you not have done. Yeah. So that was that was good. Um, Cedric, let's let's come to you first. One one draw for Norwich City at Ewood Park. It was as I said, right at the start, really frustration, probably the best way to describe it. It feels like we're probably reflecting on similar emotions to what we were talking about after QPR a, a few weeks ago. And it, it felt like a bit of a missed opportunity for Norwich. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping them sort of four point dropped. Uh, I would say, and I will add QPR as well in, in the game yesterday that hopefully it will not be against uh, uh, Norwich city at the end of uh, the season, because we just obviously three points, out of the playoff positions, um, we are obviously in a, in in a, uh, in a, in a pack of chasing that spot, and I'm really hoping that the QPR game, when we two one up, 15 minutes to play, and and again yesterday when you look when we won a lot in control and and uh, but not clinical enough, um, and then go away from 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 um, from Blackburn with only one point, so. My view is I'm I'm hoping that we no cost Norwich City at the end. Uh, so, but we'll have to see. It's, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it, Sam? And, and I've already seen a bit of this in terms of debate on 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 social media uh, and amongst Norwich fans more widely. Um, I was playing football this morning and, and kind of had a similar debate of, uh, of of some group of guys who were kind of debating the same in terms of well, a point on the road in the Championship is always a positive thing, particularly given the the home form that that Norwich have at the moment. It's one defeat in ten. They're three points off the the top six. But Cedric's right. It's hard to just sort of escape that feeling that. That potentially out of the trips to Loftus Road and Ewood Park, two teams who obviously have, have struggled, but Blackburn obviously more recently under under new management, but QPR are as well and have improved a little bit as well. Um, I, th- I think I can kind of see both sides of the argument really behind maybe it, maybe some people feeling that a point isn't the worst thing in the world, and also probably that frustration, and, and maybe they're they're not separate. Maybe you can maybe you can feel both of those things. Yeah, there are a few a few strands to it, really. I, I do sort of take Wagner's reasoning that, you know, a point away and winning at home is sort of the classic way of doing well, well, in any league, really, and especially in the Championship, given the density of competitive teams that there there is or there are in that league. But I think a lot of it, a lot of the frustration comes from how the games have gone. You have to remember both at QPR and at Blackburn, they've led. And when, you know... I know maybe Norwich weren't at their best in either of those games, but when you're leading by a goal against two teams that were in, I mean, QPR were battling relegation, Blackburn are comfortably in the bottom half of the table. And even if you're not at your best, I think in those games, you need to find a way really once you've got the lead to to see out 
the game and to take the three points. So I think Norwich fans might be looking at it slightly differently if if maybe Blackburn had gone one nil up or if there were some slightly more adverse circumstances for Norwich to navigate. But everything was there really for them to, to go and take three points and they weren't quite able to do that. There's also the feeling that they've missed the opportunity because of the other results around the Championship, I think. Coventry, West Brom, Hull, Sunderland, Watford, pretty much everyone around them apart from um, Preston, who obviously beat Coventry, dropped points. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from. We could be sitting here now on probably our most positive podcast of the season, speaking about the fact that Norwich are one point off sixth, two points off off fifth. And I know there's plenty of time. And if you zoom out and say there's 12 games left, there's 36 points left to play for, then the context does make it feel a little bit better. But just how close Norwich were to achieving a result that everyone would have been purring over and being in a position that everyone would have been excited by. I think that's probably what puts them in this this situation and this feeling of, of frustration and disappointment. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll come on to the overall kind of away form in, in just a moment. We had a little bit of the debate about it after, after QPR in terms of it maybe just slipping under the radar. I think it's fair to say it's not under the radar anymore. There are plenty of people talking about that. So we will come to that in a moment. But um, Cedric... David Wagner after the game felt it was a lack of ruthlessness really for Norwich in, in both boxes. Um, what, what are kind of your reflections on it? Because you said you, you get a team that go from scoring eight goals in two games at home to a team that maybe squandered some really good opportunities. That that maybe is, is, is that just football? Is that just something that, that you have to accept? Because it's, it's it, Josh Sargent, any striker is going to find it very difficult. And I'm not putting, pinning this obviously all on Josh Sargent, but a goal rate of, of one goal every 80 minutes, that's very difficult to sustain. So I don't know, what, what, what do you put down that lack of ruthlessness to from Norris's perspective? Because it was Josh Sargent had a chance after Gabriel Sara slipped in through. Fashnacht had one in the second half. There were, there were some big moments that maybe went begging yesterday. Yeah, exactly. I think you're right. I think in the moment uh, against Blackburn, we didn't put uh, the ball in the back of the net like we've been doing at home the past two games. You know, like you mentioned eight, eight goals in, in, in two games. I was there at Carroll Road, obviously, uh, them two games. So you could feel that uh, everything... When Norwich was going forward towards the end of the game, he, he was potentially a, a goal all the time. Um, but yeah, it's them kind of days where you can try, you can play, you know, uh, 90 plus minutes and, and, and nothing is going your, your way. And I think uh, Wagner sort of, he has all the right to be a bit annoyed in terms of uh, being clinical in the right moment, in the decisive moment yesterday, because Blackburn was there to be take, taken in the first half, uh, 100%. Um, they were obviously, obviously really um, struggling with, with, with the attacking uh, and the pace of Norwich going forward. Um, but it, for, for me, it's, it is it's more about the way we considered the goal and not obviously not being clinical enough. I think, you know, if you look, the, 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 the goal we considered against Blackburn is a set pieces. And, and Wagner obviously have been telling his players um, about the strength that Blackburn's got in, on, in terms of set pieces and, and, and score a lot of goals. And again, he showed that yesterday we we concede again on the set pieces. The goal we concede, the second goal we concede against QPR, again, you know, that can be avoided. So, you know, we do everything right when we go going forward. But like like uh, Wagner said, in our own box, sometimes we, we lack of that sort of concentrations and, and we concede. And yeah, you show against, and, and you against Watford, you know, you look Watford, you turn a lot up and we switched off and we concede two goals. Uh, we are a very dangerous team when we're going forward because we have scored a lot of goals this season. I think we scored a lot more goals this season than we done last year in the full yeah. season. So, and we got 12 games left. So we show going forward that we are a very, very, very da- dangerous team. It's just we need to, to be a bit more concentrating uh, at the back, you know, not relying on Gunny. Gunny made unbelievable saves yesterday and keep us in the game because we could have walked away with zero points yesterday easily if Gunny was not in his games. So, you know, we can't always see, rely on Gunny all the time and rely on Sargent all the time. His other players also can, can provide, uh, uh, you know, the defensive aspect, but also the attacking aspect as well. So, so yeah, is is. I can I can feel the frustration of 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 of, uh, of the boss David Wagner, but it's twelve game left. Um, you know the game are coming very fast now as well, um, and and we need to be on it. Yeah, and, and Cedric alluded to it there, Sam. But actually, had it not have been for for Angus Garnett, 
as he said, it could have been a, a very different result. I mean, I, I counted at least four excellent stops that he made. And I think three of those were, were from Sam Gallagher. There was a, a chance uh, relatively early on. There was the header, um, well, two headers, really. There was a, a shot from outside the, the box that, that he saved. Um, I mean, we, we've we've glowed about Angus Gunn for a long time on this podcast in terms of the quality that he has and uh, and his standing compared to or comparable to other championship goalkeepers. But it underlines the point, doesn't it? We, we've spoken a lot about individual moments for Norwich City this year. And often that those conversations have been framed around attacking players, John Rowe, Josh Sargent, perhaps more in, in, in recent weeks. But actually, they're, they're coming from, from him as well. And, and, and he's probably bailed Norwich City out yesterday. I think that's, that's probably fair to say, particularly given some of the chances that they conceded. Yeah, when I spoke to him post-match, there was this uh, this sort of maybe modestness or you know wanting to play it down and he talked about doing his job but I don't think there are many championship goalkeepers doing their job to to that extent and um, I think he probably will feel and this is actually what he said that he was feeling a mixture of pleasure and frustration because I don't think he should be called upon as often as as he was really to to produce moments like that and it's like you say you know we focus on the Jonathan Rose of the world and, and the players that have been contributing moments out of nothing at the other end but Gunn has has produced just as many, if not more, than any other player in in the league that have sort of denied goals. And I find it funny he's he's done it so often this season that actually I don't think I've seen too many people talking about how how good he was yesterday. And yet he's denied two goals that um, from our position sat amongst sort of the home fans. They were already celebrating. There was one in particular, the the Gallagher header from the corner that looked to I think everybody in the ground like it was it was already in and um I think I typed yeah. goal at the time yeah, to be yeah. honest as you met it because yeah. it just it just looked a certain goal yeah. it, it was yeah, really, that it, was a, not just that was not a... just the save either it's it's uh, and if you watch it back I don't know if he's done it deliberately so I might be giving him a bit more credit than perhaps he's owed but he, he does very well to kind of parry the ball into the ground so it bounces up and as a, I don't know who the following Blackburn player is but there's a Blackburn player coming in and because he pushes it down it kind of loops over him to the point where he can't he doesn't then have a, a routine header maybe, again maybe there's a bit of fortune in that but yeah. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say it was excellent technique yeah that was uh, that was an absolutely unbelievable save and uh, I think that was probably the area that I, I didn't agree with on David Wagner's assessment or, or one of them um, post-match he suggested that, that Norwich had enough chances to win the game and although you do break it down and you look at sort of Josh Sargent and uh, and when he obviously when Sarah slid him through as you you mentioned earlier and some other sort of half chances maybe Ono Hernandez could have found Christian Fastnacht and obviously there was a time when when Fastnacht probably should have gone round Ainsley Piers as well um, I think Blackburn actually had probably more chances and if both teams had been clinical then you know um, as Cedric says I think Norwich would have come away with with zero points so. You know, you can play it that way and say that if Norwich had been more clinical, they they would have won the game. But equally, Gunn has had to bail them out probably more than than they've missed chances at the other end. So, yeah, again, it was it was individual moments that have saved them. And uh, you know, it might not get the the plaudits that the likes of, of Jonathan Rowe will get. But you know, we've spoken as you said time and again this season about what an asset Angus Gunn is. And uh, yeah, if if he he does exit the club and if and when he does exit the club. Um, sort of in the coming years, they'll find it incredibly hard, in my view, to to replace him. Yeah, and he's he's, he's coming up to his final year in the summer, so that that could uh, you know get get a hurry on, come on, um, because uh, he he is a player that, that I think they they do need to sort. But like you say, with the Euros coming up, I'm sure he's got Premier League ambitions of his own. It wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be a surprise to see him linked. And then, actually, Cedric, in the same way earlier that we were kind of talking about points dropped across these two games, you have a goalkeeper there who seems to be almost winning Norwich City points. I mean, Sam referenced it there, the saves that he made. You referenced it earlier. Actually, if it wasn't for Angus Gunn, this could have been a completely different game. And instead of that one point next to their name it, it could have been zero which probably would have been you know framed this conversation again completely differently so that that's the value of having a goalkeeper as good as Angus Garn isn't it yeah completely and I think he obviously don't forget he's been injured for a while as mm. well and when he was injured we seems to be struggled uh, a little bit we seems to concede a lot of goals um, and since he came back in the team he sort of stabilized everything you know obviously the the defensive aspect but also by his saves and he make he, he make uh, um you know, obviously, a keeper makes some unbelievable save, but he make he makes save in the very key moment when we are struggling. 
uh, uh, just an example, Coventry at home, you know, mm. uh, we won her down, we're chasing, he make two outstanding saves, you know, and we could have been easy to nail down, but we went to win the game. Uh, and towards the end of that game, he, you know, 1v1 with Palmer, he make a great save again. So, you know, he stabilized, he, 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 he's very calm as well. Um, uh, and for me, he make key moment uh, in the game, some unbelievable save. Do you feel, Cedric, that he's he's improved as a goalkeeper since since coming back to Norwich the second sweat? It feels now that like he's a, a little bit more commanding and, and, and maybe making probably a better range of saves than perhaps he, he, he was yeah, previously. Yeah, and, and I think it comes from the confidence of the manager. You know, he's the number one now. Uh, mm. When he came to the club, he, he, you know, I think Tim Crow was his, the number one. And I think, you know, obviously having the, the confidence of the manager just lift you and, and give you sort of that, 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 that confidence to to be you know to be was the word because when you're number two you're not really part of the the team because you don't know if you're going to play you only play them odd games uh but when you're number one you are there you know you're going to be uh, a starter so he's obviously gained a lot of confidence and 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 experience as well you know because yeah he's still he's still young but he's he, he, he's an experienced player as well now because he's obviously an international Scottish as well. So, you know, playing with, you know, good players and big players, they give you that confidence. And, and, and I think he's a good hard worker as well. You know, he's very, like Sam said, he's a very modest person as well. And, and, and it's not easy to be backing up his dad as well, but he's doing mm. that fantastically. Yeah, yeah, he is absolutely, and 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 that's that's a really good point that you make actually, because it that can become a shadow for players, can't it? And the fact that that he hasn't let it is is a good thing. And Sam, for for all you know, the jest kind of around his situation in terms of personally, do you feel that there's a a, a natural concern for Norwich fans looking at the the performances that he's produced? And okay, there's maybe been a couple of I wouldn't necessarily say they were errors, but I think there were things that with his high standards to cross against um, uh, against Cardiff and obviously the one against QPR as well. I, I think maybe he, he would have felt on both he could have done slightly better. I think there was a slight deflection in the QPR one. He, he shows his quality consistently. And as a goalkeeper, again, it, it feels game by game, really, he's proving himself to be certainly above championship level, doesn't it? Yeah, I think there will be teams that are that are interested. And although he maybe doesn't attract the, the glamour of the transfer rumour that a Jonathan Rowe or, or a Gabriel Sara might create, there's no way he's not going to be on the radar of, of some of those clubs. And it's not just, as you said earlier, about Norwich. It's the fact that he's got to go and, and play on an international stage that everyone will be watching uh, in a few short months. And, you know, that's assuming that obviously he goes. And I think we all are, unless unless there's injury involved. So, um, yeah, I think for Norwich fans, that will, that will increasingly be a concern. I think Josh Sargent is in the same sort of boat and it's getting to the point now where there's a a growing cluster of players that Norwich probably look at and, and feel that they might need to replace and that's where a worry comes in that I don't think there's been for a while obviously for the last couple of years that, that Krul was at the club Gunn was the clear succession plan and, and he was the one that was going to be the number one in the future I don't think anybody had any doubt any doubts about that but now you're in a situation where Gunn is alongside not only an older goalkeeper in George Long, but one who, despite having maybe done OK, I don't think has, has suggested he's good enough to be a number one at a club that, that looks to challenge for promotion every time they're in the Championship. And in a sense, I think George Long's little spell in the team did help highlight how good Gunn has been because you couldn't really look at those long performances and say that he'd been especially bad. You know, he's a player who's played loads and loads of games in the AFL and had success at that level sort of throughout his his career and yet he came in and there, you, there was a real noticeable drop off in the quality um in that position so i think goalkeepers in a sense at times are are ones where you know you, ne you never really appreciate how good they are until you don't have them and that spell without angus in goal i think i think really helped norwich fans appreciate maybe what what he adds and I'm sure there will be other teams um probably in the top flight that that also appreciate what he does and and you know that we've seen him previously make moves to to further his career and although everyone knows the connection that he has to this football club and he's been incredibly reliable and dependable um avoiding the lure of of some of those clubs especially when Norwich are, are in the financial situation that they are that would be would be pretty difficult so he's definitely on the list of players that the Norwich fans will have an eye on in the summer. 
And when it comes to replacing him, um, yeah, I think that could be a really tricky one. Yeah, unless they get FA Cup George Long because he's he's like uh, he's like yeah, Gianlu- yeah. Gianluigi Buffon in the in the cup. He made some excellent saves against Liverpool and Bristol Rovers in the in the in the replay. Go on, Cedric. Well, we we, we could say the same about uh, George Sargent before he mm. went to the World Cup as well. You know, um, unfortunately, with international players, they're always on the spotlight, always on the highlight when you come to the Euros or the World Cup, uh, uh, and then obviously there is there is Norwich City uh, as a football club to make sure that they can keep them them players uh, and extend their contract because yeah. because first and foremost they're not just only good players they are also also very good very good persons and you can see that the way they conduct themselves after games you know I've obviously I've been going a lot to Carroll this year and I always look the little details of the players how long they stay after after a game how long they take uh, and take their time to sign autographs and and, and taking photos and 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 sergeants and um, and Gunny, they are the one. I'm not saying all the others, but everybody, uh, but mainly them two, they are very, very good with the fans. And Sargent's it's become one of the Norwich City fans' favourites. doesn't come from, from nowhere, not just because of his goals, it's because the way he conducts himself. Yeah, bang on. And, and Cedric, I was, I was uh, going to give you the, the pleasure to speak about that Marcelino Nunez free kick. I mean, it's, oh. it's an interesting one because when, when, when that happened and, and Kenny McLean gets, gets fouled, to me, initially, I felt, oh, this is a bit too close. It's a bit too central. You know, you tend to prefer those free kicks where you can get a proper bit of bend on it. Yeah. But the, the technique that, that he he did just to float that over the wall away from the keeper and to actually curl it into the into the net is, is a wonderful piece of, uh, of technique on that free kick. To be fair, I was very surprised that he took the free kick because obviously uh, um, uh, against um, Cardiff, was uh, Sarah and usually Sarah is the one on the edge of the box. He's always the one who take any free kicks. It doesn't matter if he's central or on the right or maybe on the left. He, he took, you know, Sarah take everything. But but because obviously, like you said, he's very close to the the eighteen yard um, box. The, the 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 pace of the strike to go over the wall and bear in mind. Blackburns, they are very big players. They're very mm. athletic. And he, he went well over that wall. But is that Ben going back? That is, that is a technique is unbelievable. You know, it's almost like you have to take the ball right underneath and just cover with his foot to make that spin to go back. And if you look at the keeper, he has no chance. No ch- he didn't even, even move. He was so far away. Yeah, and I, th- I think he was I, I, watching it like the rest of us, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's, he's incredible. You know, Sarah is mm. slightly different seven days early when he was slightly a bit further on, on the right-hand side and, and, and away and he just curly. Uh, but, but, but when you are close to the goal like that, it's all about the pace. You can't go too slow. He has to have the pace, the perfect technique to just go, you put your foot around the ball and just... It's like the tennis players when they, 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 they play and, and hit the ball. They make so much spin, so much space, uh, pace on, 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 on the ball. And a footballer is exactly the same. You know, they have to generate a, a very quick pace to go around the ball and go around the wall for the keeper not to move. And he, he couldn't even move the keeper. And, and you, you spoke about it a little bit there, Cedric, but do you think that, that distance to the goal, is that the reason why maybe Nunez went, actually, I think this is better suited to what I, why I am capable yeah. to do? The Cardiff yeah. one was slightly further out. It requires a different type of technique and different kind of skill set, doesn't it? Yeah, Sarah is not someone who just hit the ball really hard when he goes free kick. He's more sort of like uh, uh, pre- precision, precisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nunez was more about the power and we can see that he generates a lot of power because the way he, Sometimes, even against Cardiff, the way he dictates the, 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 the passes, you can see that he's got a very accurate um, strike, Nunes, uh, when, you know, when he's the pattern, the way he played with long passes. He's got very accurate pa- uh, passes. The, the free kick, as I said, I was surprised that he took it. But on the other side, I wasn't because we know that he scored spectacular goals. Um, and that is one of them uh, again yesterday. But the, as I said, the free kick is purely, purely uh, a beautiful technique. Um, and I take, it take a lot of times, a lot of hours after trainings to, to precise themselves to, as I said, to generate that, that, that strike is incredible. Yeah, the, the manipulation of the ball, like you say, is just, just incredible. And, and but, Sam, I guess it's, it's, sorry, Cedric, go on if you, if you want to jump back a, in. As, as you mentioned, to be close to that goal and generate the power and the pace 
to go over the wall and make the keeper not moving is mm. incredible. Yeah, it is. And, and, and Sam, we, we know that this is something that he's got in his locker. I mean, the, the one he scored away at Hull uh, very early on under, uh, in, that, in that season under Dean Smith was a little further out, very different type of strike. We, we obviously saw the, the volley against, against Birmingham. This is a player who technically is, is, is very, very, very capable and very good. And, and, and yesterday's strike probably epitomised that. But, but equally, his performances in-game as well, in-games, away from de dead ball situations. And actually, when he does play, it doesn't feel like a coincidence that Norwich City have, have probably greater control of games, but, but also are, are, are significantly improved in possession as well. Yeah, I think when you, when you list those attributes, that's probably why there was a, a level of frustration around his performances for, for a year or so. He's somebody who not only has that technical ability that you speak about, but David Wagner spoke... And Dean Smith, to be fair, did the same when he was in charge about how how far and how hard Marcelino Nunez runs and how hard he works in a game. And you put those two aspects together and he should be the complete championship midfielder. So I think when towards the back end of last season and the start of this season, he was struggling to put in good enough performances to really be in that starting eleven. There was understandable frustration from, from Norwich fans because there was a player that you could see with the attributes that that could actually take you to, to championship success. So I'm glad he's managed to actually finally put it together and it feels like they're really managing to, to maximise his potential. And although I know there have been plenty of criticism of, criticisms of of David Wagner and maybe some of the, the issues that he's had, you've got to give him credit for Marcelino Nunez because he looks a completely different player now to, to the one that he did sort of towards the end of, of Dean Smith's reign. And... Uh, yeah, maybe he should be contributing more sort of at the top end of the pitch, but he is playing now in this this deeper role. And when he has that time and space to just ping these passes sort of all the way across the pitch and, and in both directions, he is a really, really useful tool. And um, I remember back in that, that Leeds game when they were 1-0 down and it felt quite unlike a David Wagner team, the, the way that they were playing. It felt quite strange to see them dominating possession and zipping the ball around so quickly and, and comfortable in possession. And Marcelino Nunez was, was absolutely at the heart of that. So I think where Norwich have been slightly more proactive, and they have done that in recent months and, and gone after games a little bit more, um, that's, that's suited Nunez. And you heard it from Wagner post-match. He's gone from a position where he was regularly on the bench to actually one of the first names on the team sheet and uh, his form combined with the likes of, of Ashley Barnes and Sarah obviously picking up in, in the last couple of week, weeks as well has has given Wagner some real decisions to make through the middle of the pitch and um, yeah, it's testament to, to Nunez and how much he's put together all the, the positive parts of his game um, to now be in that position. Do you feel, Cedric, that he's a player that's suited to certain games? Because it, it feels like when Norwich do have the ball, like uh, particularly at home against the low block, it feels in those conditions it's it's the type of game that really suits him. And then obviously you go and drop him into, let's say, the game against QPR a couple of weeks ago where it's intense and it's blood and thunder. That that doesn't necessarily feel like it, it, it bodes his skill set. So for, for, for David Wagner, is it about picking and choosing the games that he can drop him into? Yeah, it's exactly what I was thinking when Sam was talking about. Uh, it seems to be picked par different games. You know, obviously when Norwich are more in positions, it's where he's, he's, he start or he come slightly early in the game uh, to dictate that, that, that ball. And, and, and he's very good at it. He's, he's a typical South American player where the games in South America is based on positions. And you can see that the way he, he's a technical player, he's comfortable on very tight areas. But also if you give him too much space, like Sam said, he will pin ball left and right centers. Um, for me, for me, I don't know. I don't know if everyone have noticed that, but I, I feel like he have he has gained some muscle mass uh, since he arrived from the from 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 South America. He's, he looked more strong. He looked more solid. The way in his run, the way he go he go to tackles, he stay on his on his legs a lot stronger, a lot better now than before. He was on the floor quite often. Um, so obviously that is down to the player that he, he probably had a program and work on it um, and has his work ethic but it's all about taking your chances you know the, the, the training sessions all week is one thing the game is the bonus if you can make an impact on the gaffer's eyes he do it and he take his chances you know when he come on usually he's, 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 he's outstanding as, as Sargent has been and, and at Gunny we talk about Dean you know the last game we played at home against Cardiff, I thought, for me personally, he was the man of the match. He was dictating everything. Everything went now starting. 
it was starting from Nunes. So, you know, yes, I think he get used par different games. Uh, if the game is more physical, he won't probably start. Um, but when Norwich got sort of like a, a, a game when they are at home against Cardiff, for example, he will come. He will. He will start and dictate. And I think so how uh, Wagner is using him. And and I think, I think uh, Nunes probably know that as well and accepted that. I, I wanted to ask you because obviously you, you've you've done it in your life. You've you've gone as a player from France to England, and and, and there would have been a period of adaptation to that. And I, I recognise it's slightly different in terms of geography. And you were only yeah. what, uh, however long on, on a plane, and he he's come from halfway across the world, yeah. but. The, the adaptation periods for players, and I'm sure there's probably a lot more maybe to support them now than, than maybe perhaps what, what, what you had when, when you joined the club. But how important is, is that kind of understanding that he does take players from overseas periods of time and differing periods of time as well to adapt to not just football in England, but, but also life in England? Yeah, no, exactly. And for me, is 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 player adapt themselves very quickly. Some of them depend on their character. Uh, Nunes... When he came to the club, uh, he's starting straight away and, and he had some very good games. Uh, but I think for me, the game has developed in more intelligence of, of, of the game. The, the players have to uh, um, e uh, educate themselves about how the manager wants to play. He's not all, always on the training field. He's all, also watching videos. He's watching, uh, analyzing the, the way they, 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 they perform on the pitch. And I think Wagner is very he is very strong on that, and he will not throw a player who don't understand how you want the player to play. The player have to earn not just on the pitch, but videoing, uh, uh, accumulating some 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 uh, um, information, educating himself from details. That my time, it was none of that. You know, it was you play, and that's it. Um, but I I don't what Nunes done because I went to play in South America. And mm -hmm. South America, the pace of the game is, 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 is a lot slower because the grass is higher. Uh, and it's all about ball. It's about touching the ball. If you look, Nunes, when he came at the club, how many times he was touching the ball before he was making a pass? If you look at him now, he played the game more as a European player. So he's less touches and he can see the first time he played the ball. Um, so that obviously that is, is learn the the the... The, the, the pace, but how we play in Europe. I have to be a high speed. He has to play a lot lower limited touches. Then in, in South America, it's completely the opposite. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting, actually, really interesting. And I guess that, that shows, Sam, just to cap off this conversation, kind of the journey that, that he's been on and maybe why his has been a little bit longer and taken a little bit longer than, than Gabriel Sara, who seemed to just yeah. kind of slot in a very different type of skill set. He was probably a bit more of a physical profile um, and, and that probably as we know is a lot better to just kind of being dropped into the championship Nunez has had to go on a little bit of a journey as Cedric has, has outlined in terms of his physicality and maybe even tweaking elements of, of his own game Yeah I still think the physicality is actually something that, that he has he has improved upon and maybe is underrated a little bit like, uh, like Cedric said earlier you can see that he's put a bit more on there was one time where uh, I can't remember which Blackburn midfielder it was, but it was one of those one of those typical championship midfielders that maybe had the the height and the size that that you uh, you associate them with. And he actually shoulder barged one of them off the off the ball, sort of halfway through the second half. And you saw that, and you thought actually there's a, a guy who's clearly learning to use his his frame and his his stature in the right sort of way because he can't make himself any taller. Um, and he can't sort of change some of the, the physical aspects, obviously, of, of how he is. But he seems to me like he's learning the sort of discretions of that and the details of, of using himself in the right way in that sort of sense. And, and when you combine actual physicality in terms of duels with the sort of numbers he gets through running wise, I think he, he can still be underrated as a, a physical asset to Norwich. And you look at him and you just think, oh, he can't play as a number six. He needs to have a, a Kenny McLean alongside him or Norwich need to sign a... I mean, I, I do still think Norwich need to sign an out-and-out -out defensive midfielder, but I think people people feel that Nunez needs that alongside him to, to play better. And I'm not sure that's always the case, you know, as as obviously both of you discussed before. I still think it's a little bit of a, a horses-for-courses -courses situation with Nunez and to get the best out of him, you do want to use him in, in certain games. But um, yeah, I think he's improved on on all of those sides of his game, and uh, yeah, he's definitely going in the right direction in that sense. Even if maybe 
quite a lot of people still don't seem to have to have caught up to that yet. Yeah, indeed. And and Sam, just to kind of bounce it back onto you, because I I think Cedric's going to have a very different um, perspective on this, having having played the game. But but Norwich City's form on the road at the at the moment, it's um, it's it's not great, is it? I mean, it's it, four wins on the road, seventeen points, and. You look at the teams below them, Stoke, who are in the relegation zone, Huddersfield, who have been embroiled in a relegation dogfight all season, Plymouth, who have been quite hit and miss, but their home forms probably um, will probably mean that they, they're going to be OK. Uh, Birmingham, who have had their own uh, trials and tribulations and managers this season, Sheffield Wednesday and Rotherham, who have basically been rooted to the table all season. 17 points they're averaging a point a game on, on the road and, and you compare that to some of their their championship playoff rivals so Hull in the away table sit fifth Coventry are in eighth Preston in ninth West Brom have, have improved over the last few weeks and and, and kind of parachuted themselves up to an 11th albeit they've only taken three more points on the road than Norwich it feels like Norwich have, have gone a long way this year to correct a lot of issues that they've had at various points being too open in transition not getting the balance of the team right then they had to fix how they were shipping goals then they had to fix a little bit trying to get the attacking balance back and, and, and balancing that back off the one thing that's kind of remained a, a, an Achilles heel throughout this this season has been their, their their form on the road I mean it's it's I think one win in in, in seven now uh, league games on, on the road I mean that's doesn't feel conducive to a side that's that's going to finish in the top six. And as Cedric says earlier, who knows? Come the end of the season, those four points dropped in two games against QPR and Blackburn maybe look back on as 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 being the difference. Yeah, and I think there has been a, a recognition from from Wagner and from when I spoke to Angus yesterday about the fact that home form generally is better and people do look at your home games as your opportunities to pick up more points. And I do agree with that. It is and it should be easier to to get points at Carrow Road and they've done well in actually making that a bit of a, a fortress despite obviously some of the uh, the issues there's maybe been between those in the on the pitch and, and the fans at times this season but I don't think it should be a, as big a gap as it is you know as you said there like the uh, the fact that they're was it 18th and they're, they're yeah. yeah right down towards the bottom of, of the championship in that, in that away rec- record compared to where they are with their home record, you know, it shouldn't really be that big of a gap. And I don't think that's down to luck. I'm sure we'll come on to the reasons why it is, but I don't think it's as simple as, as they've got the fans around them at Carrow Road and they haven't got as many fans at away grounds. I think Wagner probably is, is one of, one of your more old school managers when it comes to the different setup in, in home and away games. One of the more tangible and obvious Parts of that is the fact that usually he drops a striker and goes with Gabriel Sara in the sort of advanced role um, in those away games. So, yeah, I think part of it is actual tactical and footballing aspects. I don't think it's all about the atmosphere and the psychology and the maybe off the pitch associations with, with playing away from home. Of course, they will have an impact. And I suppose that's where I'm saying the differential is between home and away and where the small gap you feel is. But I think there's too much of a a gap afforded between home and away games and too much consideration given at times to the fact that, that you are away from, from your home ground. And actually Wagner, a few press conferences ago, spoke about the fact that the idea doesn't change wherever they go. And although some of the base principles might remain the same, I'm not sure I, I agree with that at large. So I think there are a few reasons for that. But what's what's clear and obvious to everyone is that they have to narrow that gap between home and away form because... You know, as much as you can look at the home home stuff as a positive, there will be that frustration if they don't make the playoffs at the end of the season. That 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 improving that could have been the very small difference they needed to to get them into that top six. Uh, and Cedric, obviously, you, you've 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 played the game um, at a significantly higher level than than either of us too. But but you know, you have that experience of, of of feeling that differential home and away. So I guess the the easiest question for me to ask, and probably the hardest for you to answer is why does this Norwich City team, um, in terms of the home table, rank as a top six side and they, they're, they're sixth in the home table, but then you put them on you know, same pitches in different stands and different fans and they become basically a lower mid-table team on the road. Why, why is there that big swing in difference um, for, for players on the road generally, but but also for this Norwich City side? Well, I think, I think um, David Wagner have to sort of sit down and... Have, have a look um, because if you remember we 
we used to consider our goals just before Christmas uh, away. Um, we had to open, poor in transitions. So yeah, obviously I had to go back to the training ground and and work really hard with, with the squad to be a lower block or more di difficult to beat and play a 4-4-2. You can see clearly some, some games is, is two line of four and two strikers and then two strikers are very deep as well. So he has to go back to the sort of the basic uh, and, and that's probably take quite a while. Um, what I can't put my head around is only four win in all season. We're coming to March and we're just still outside the playoff. I can't remember any teams in the past who only won four win away and be that close to be in the playoff position. I, 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 it's just like I can't really put my head around. And But again, he will... You know, Sam said, and you, you mentioned as well, we, we only got 12 games left. How many how many games away we have got in the last 12? That six. Was, six, <laughs> exactly. Oh, wow. So in, in, in the last six away games, we probably need to pick up three or four wins, I would say. Because, you know, depending on who we play the last six games at home, we're probably going to have hiccups at home as well. Uh, and, and that can be the difference as well. So, you know, it, as I said, is. Is, is I can't really honestly. It's, it's quite hard to to explain or to to answer your question because I'm still flabbergasted about only four wins in the full season. Um, I can't. Obviously, the last time we we won away was probably Hull City, if yep. I'm right. Yep. Yep. If you remember before that, I can't remember the last before Hull City when we won. Bristol City, I think, off the top of my head. But yeah, that was, when, yeah. when, when we scored the last second of the yeah. game. Yeah. So, you know, it's not obviously away games at that time was not very consistent. And and we always said, even me, when I was going uh, commentating some of the games, it was always coming back to consistency. If you speak to any ex-players, they come back to consistency. And unfortunately, we haven't been consistent away. Uh, and that can be... A trigger of not being in a position of the playoff. We will have to see. We've got six away games. As I said, we probably need to 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 win three or four games away. Uh, did, did you feel it as a player? A difference going away from home, and and, and maybe a psychological difference. Did, did you feel like going away from home was 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 tougher as uh, as a player? Yes, yes. Um, because as 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 a player, when you play home, you go you go your your ritual, you know where you stand, you know, you, you know, when you move on the pitch, you know where obviously where the stand is and stuff like that. It's like a bit of a boxer when you get knocked in the head. Sometimes you get disorient, disorient, disorientated. And I think when you play away, especially, and that is my opinion, when I, because I was playing on the wing, sometimes I was like <laughs> a bit confused. Where is the away stand? Where is not the away stands? Um, but for me, it's more about, it's more about how the manager wants to set up when you play away. You know, obviously, uh, Wagner went away and wanted to be very strong, very hard to beat. But sometimes, uh, as we saw in, in, in a lot of games, the transition been defending to attacking because we're so far from the attacking half, it can be dangerous against us because the opposition can win the ball very quickly in our own half and they are quite close to score. And we are too far to attack. And we can see even sometimes, like our own, when we win the ball, we got nothing to play forward because the two strikers are so deep, um, but yeah, I just I just think, as I said to you, is is four wins all season and we're still outside the play, playoff spot. It's just madness, completely madness. Yeah, and and and, and there's, there's that aspect, and there's also the aspect that that Cedric touched upon earlier, Sam, is it doesn't half put pressure on your on your home form because essentially it means. I mean, I've, I've tried to do the maths as to what it would get, you know, what they'd need to get to about uh, to seventy points. And I think it was about seven to eight wins. Obviously, you could throw some draws in there as well. I'm not very good at maths. You, you I can see you're doing the numbers in your in your head. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're not going to be able to do all of them at home. They're, they're going to need they're going to need to pick up points on on the road as well. But but also, it, it basically means that they're going to have to be faultless at home as well if they can't back up the, with, with, with some results on the road. Which I think, to be fair, David Wagner kind of conceded yesterday. Yeah, I think uh, they they would get to seventy points if they won every single game at home. But with the the quality of the playoffs or the playoff race this season, I'm not quite sure. Just exactly seventy is is going to get you in there. Bearing in mind how poor 
the championship was from top to bottom really last season and, and Sunderland got in with 69. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. They can't they can't just absolutely settle on home form. And as you said, the, the amount of pressure that it puts on them because pretty much every time we speak to them now, and I don't know if you're finding this sort of speaking to the players as well, uh, I suppose the away issue has become more of a thing recently. So, so maybe not, but there seems to be this increasing thing of oh well we've survived the away thing now let's get back to home where we get our points and and as you say that mentality is what makes it quite difficult really when you look at the amount of pressure there is on Carrow Road because it's almost getting to the point of oh well you know it doesn't it doesn't matter what happens away we'll solve all of our problems at home and I know that's a an oversimplification and maybe an exaggeration of of where we are at this moment in time, but it feels like there is certainly a sort of micro version of that happening. And um, yeah, as you said, at some point, probably they, they aren't going to win at home. And you look at some of the fixtures they've got, I think compared to some of their playoff rivals, they have got some slightly favourable fixtures, but they've got difficult tests in there. They've got, uh, dare I mention it, a, a derby with Ipswich Town coming up in, in April. And these aren't givens just because they've been excellent at home. You know they haven't won every single game at home, and they've still had their fair share of issues. They've had poor performances at home. They've had a two-nil lead against Leeds and, and ended up losing that game. And although they're in a good vein of form at the moment, to be able to rely on yourselves to to get results there for three months, uh, you know, as well as probably adding some results away from home, is is probably a little bit of of over reliance. So, yeah, there are probably some issues with the way that that things are. It feels like every podcast is is a discussion about sustainability in in different variations and at the moment it feels like how sustainable is relying on getting your points at home versus playing quite poorly away from home and, and getting the points there so although i i do agree that it's easier to get results at home i think there's a little bit too much of a mentality of winning at home is is almost a given and winning at home is absolutely what you must do and then being away is just just to top up points because it could be actually the reverse where at some point they they lose a game at home and rather than saying, oh, it's okay, we've got a game at Carrow Road, they're going to have to say, okay, but we've got this away game that we now need to win. And if they've let that mentality of of everything away as a bonus seep into them at that point, then you wonder if, if they'll be able to just switch on and, and go again away from home when they, they really do need those points. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's anything that, that is unsolvable and you know as, as Cedric says I'm sure I'm sure Wagner will sit down and look at what's going wrong there but uh yeah without too much time left of the season you probably want them to sort it out before long because they will need to get two or three wins away from home if they're to to ultimately get into the top six you, you mentioned consistency Cedric and, and Sam's yeah. touched upon this as well how important is the consistency of approach both home and away and and, and is the fact that Norwich are altering and changing what they're doing based on where they're playing is that having a, a negative impact on what they're doing on their on, on their travels do you feel I think sometimes I think sometimes can you know I think too much rotation can destabilize players um I think we t- we talk about uh, on numerous occasion about that because David Wagner liked to rotate quite a lot. Um, if you if you look, he rotate a lot on the left hand side, especially with the two fullbacks. Um, not so much on the right hand side, um, and, and the two centre back as well. He liked to 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 have a different combination with the two centre backs. So sometimes that can destabilize a little bit some of the players. Um, you know, you drop a midfield as a centre back, which McLean is a very intelligent player and a very good player. He, he, you know, even if you put him as a left winger, he'd probably be still the best player on the pitch. Um, but yeah, it is. The, I I think it, it do stabilize, destabilize the players, but also when the players is doing well and he's got momentum, you know, why why to drop him and put another player? You know, that can have consequences. We we saw Nunes. Come off injured with an hamstring, I think. I believe. Yeah. You know, you have the same uh, issue with Jonathan Rowe. Come off with an hamstring injury. So I'm not saying because of the rotations, but you know, the, the players need to have a bit of momentum. But again, David Wagner probably see different things that we see. He probably he obviously he saw his players every day of the of, of of the week. He probably believe that some of the players have got fatigues, but. You know, 
I, I do think is is a very very important to find a, a consistency in the pickup of his start eleven and not always make a drastic change um, because maybe he he was scratching his head to 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 start with somebody uh, uh, as uh, in a positions away and then suddenly you could see that we saw on a couple of occasions that he was taking a players at half time um, because he probably was not. So 100% happy with his decision before the game starts. Um, but that have a, an impact on the players, uh, usually. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the away or home games winning, I think for me it would be, the, the, the key would be for David Wagner to pick up the right formation, the right start 11, and have a good sort of, like, just 12 games, have a good consistency in terms of running, who is playing uh, week in, week out. Yeah, I, I I I agree, and actually, you would hope, particularly in 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 this two games, really, which was a bit, uh, and obviously, I, I think Hernandez has, has had a bit of knock, uh, a bit of a knock. And you mentioned Ashley Barnes feeling fatigued, but you'd hope with the full weeks that they've got in this kind of block before, obviously, the 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 free game week that they've got, that it maybe be able to find that consistency a little bit more. And I know it it does irk some people with, with the, the the old changing your winning team thing. I'm I'm not sure I've ever just on an unrelated note ever uh, seen a coach who is as happy to change his back four as consistently, even within games, as David Wagner. It's not necessarily criticism. It's just not something that you see very often. Um, I remember um, I even have been by you, Cedric, when you coached me. But there have been various coaches who always kind of reiterated the importance of stability at, stability. at the back and. Actually, when you start plucking people out of there, and obviously, look, sometimes you have to do that through necessity and injuries and whatnot, but just changing for the sake of changing in game sometimes feels slightly detrimental sometimes to to, to what you're to what you're trying to do. And um, before we, we we look ahead to what is, I think, quite an important game next weekend, I just thought, Cedric, since you you know you're you're on, um, what what's your feeling at the moment? Norwich City's top six race. Where, where do you feel it? And, and maybe this is uh, the a million pound question or whatever. But three points at the moment behind Hull. Do you think they have enough? Can show enough? Can find an extra gear to to break inside the the top six and and obviously be there at the, at the end of the season? I'm um, I'm going to be really honest. I I think we have reached our peak to be where we are. Uh, we're standing so far behind because the result before Christmas was not where it's supposed to be. Uh, it took a lot of hard work from Wagner on the training field to put everything right. And I think they have, hard, they have worked really, really hard to be where they are, just outside the playoff. I think to go to the next sort of step would take a bit too much for the players to achieve. I think, I think it's possible that we can finish in a playoff. If you ask me if we're going to get promoted, I'm not so sure. Uh, we got key players getting injured at the minute. We had key players, important players, experienced players got injured at the beginning of the season uh, and they are coming back. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where... I'm not sure where... I, I, I don't think we got another gear to go. I think we are at the, at the, at the max at the moment. Um, and, and it could be potentially why David Vanner keep changing and rotating the players. Yeah, that's that's an in, that's an interesting theory. I mean, I, mean, I, I wonder, because it's all about hitting form at the right time, isn't it? And I just wonder if they've maybe hit we, form a little bit too early. That is my point. I think we, we, if you look where we're starting and where we are now is, is a contrast of, of three months. Um, mm. uh, and as I said, I think potentially we are a maximum. Um, Yes, in championship, you've got teams who, who start very quickly uh, and then they go up there off a blip halfway through the season and finish strongly again. Um, and, and us finishing strongly, I, 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 I've got a question on that. Yeah, me too. And Sam, it's 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 another big game at Carrow Road next weekend, which I guess lends into to what we're speaking about because it's Sunderland come to Carrow Road. They have been in the in the top six shake up for the majority of the season. They've uh, obviously just had a managerial change. They got beat by Plymouth at, at, at the weekend. Um, they they're gonna uh, both sides really for Norwich. They're gonna see this as a real opportunity to to hammer home what is at the moment. I, I'll have a look when you're speaking what the points gap is, but there is a gap of points there, and they'll obviously be able to extend it. But on the flip side of that, Sunderland will see it as an opportunity to kind of um, not salvage because I don't think we we're quite at that stage, but certainly to to put their or maybe to prevent their their playoff push from from stalling again. So again, it feels like another very as Coventry and Hull and West Brom have been over recent weeks. Feels like a big game at Carrow next weekend. 
Yeah, I think as you say, it might be a a bigger one for for Norwich for Sunderland, sorry, than than it is for Norwich. Um, I, I feel like with the amount of games left, if if the away form wasn't in the position that it was, Norwich could maybe even take a point and keep Sunderland at sort of arm's length and and then rely on their form sort of going into the rest of the season. But you also have to view it, and every game really now is is an opportunity because as much as Sunderland have been in sort of the, the playoff mix, they're in really poor form at the moment. They're, I think, 10th in the league, which isn't, you know, isn't especially impressive. And if Norwich do want to break into that, that top six, they have quite a few opportunities left, but every one of them is, is a big one. So, uh, yeah, it does feel quite large compared to basically every game in the first half of the season, but it feels like we're saying that now now every week. So I think the players, I think Wagner, I think everyone connected to the club now knows how big every single one is. That's just that's just the championship at this stage of the season. The good news for them is that so far this season they've they've tended to really step up on the big occasions, especially at Carrow Road, as you, you listed those teams, you know, Coventry, West Brom, uh, I mean, even Hull, that was that was away from home, but that was a huge game and they managed to, to, to go and win that one. So, mentality-wise, they seem to be even more up for, for those big games at, at Carrow Road. So, that's definitely something going into their favour uh, going into to next week. But, yeah, as you say, the, the pressure's on, but what's new when it comes to this stage of the Championship season? Yeah, and, and just to, to map it out, so Norwich are seventh in, in it with, with 52 points, Sunderland 10th on, on 47. So it's a, a five-point gap at the moment, Cedric. So we're either, and it, of course it could be a draw, but the, the two outcomes are we could be talking about an eight-point gap for Norwich or, or a two-point gap. Very different scenarios in terms of then moving ahead or, or potentially um, allowing a, a competitor to claw back a little bit of space for you. So as Sam said, it probably feels maybe like a bigger game for Sunderland than, than it is for Norwich, but because of everything we've discussed, winning at home is going to be essential for them, isn't it? Yeah, and we also discussed that we will have a game at home that we're not going to be able to pick up the three points, you know. Um, but like Sam said, you know, we always seem to pick up on big occasions. Um, and again, next weekend will be a big occasion. Don't forget that Sunderland just sacked their manager as well. So I'm not sure if someone's going to be in place for that game or if he's a caretaker. So obviously... You know, players want to to show what they are capable of of of, of doing and and push on for their for their playoff spot as well. But I I, I think because we have got a, we are in a very good form at home, and I think we need to keep pushing that way. Um, if we want to be at the end of of the season, uh, in in a top six, um, like Sam said, you know, the season's coming to a closure soon. Um, we need to keep pushing. We need to 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 pick up the the, the away games. That I think for me is the key. The the key is the away games. Yeah, three straight defeats for Sunland. So it's um yeah, you, you expect that they're gonna they're, they're definitely gonna want a reaction next weekend at at Carrow Road, and it's um it's definitely gonna be another big one for Norwich City. Cedric, thank you very much for your time. It's been brilliant having you. We didn't even get to speak about, you know, your thoughts on me as a player when you used to coach me. So, <laughs> I used to coach uh, what, you, yeah. what, what, a sh- what a shame. And, and a very co- good coach you were as well. And uh, oh, I'm, I'm not just saying that because uh, because you're you're here, but it's been great to have you on and have your insight and nice to have some culture on the podcast. We were brilliant French accent compared to the, <laughs> the Norfolk one and the Midlands one that we usually have with with Paddy so um so yeah thank you very much for for coming on and um thank you for your insight it was, it was no, thank uh, you a pleasure for to have me. you good thank man you Sam thank you as ever you'll be back next week though so I won't I won't thank you in the same yeah time. sorry about my accent <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly thank you all very much for watching and listening of course and I say this every week if you listen you can watch us on YouTube and if you watch us on YouTube hello uh, you can also uh, listen to us as well so you don't have to although you know with with Cedric in the building of course you'd want to look at his face but certainly uh, our mugs <laughs> I can understand why you why you wouldn't um, thank you very much and we will be back next week after as we've just teed up what it, what feels like another really big game at Carrow Road see you then